Here's the message of the Gospels according to Jesus. The time has come. The kingdom is at hand. Repent, change the way you think about everything, and believe the new thing, which is there is a way to live in the kingdom of God starting now on into eternity. This is the good news. The question is, how does a person get into the kingdom of God? The way into the kingdom is through Jesus. But here's the problem. That's not what we tell people. We're all born into different sizes and shapes and ethnic groups and genders, all varieties of people all over the world. In those different identities, we're often told or we're often raised to think that my identity or my group is the best right group. And so when I meet a person from another background, another group, my message to them is if you want to live in the kingdom, you have to be like me that you have to leave your group and come into my group in order to go into the kingdom. That message does one thing in the world. It produces conflict. This isn't really the straight way in that Jesus talks about. Here's the reality of what Jesus is saying. You can be who you are and walk straight in your own identity through Jesus into the kingdom. That's the amazing thing that that although there's only one way to the Father is through Jesus, Jesus is on every road and he's welcoming each of us into the kingdom through him and not by trying to be something that we're not. In that way, the kingdom of God is not all just people like me that think the way I think, but it's this diverse, beautiful, all nations of every tongue, tribe, and ethnic group joining together in the kingdom, transformed in unity and diversity thanking God, praising God. Yes! That's it! Thanks for coming. Why are we doing that? What are we doing? We're going in and we're going in and taking a person and chopping up their identity and trying to make it into us. And, and this produces war. Is that what Jesus was saying? Is that the mission? Or is it that beautiful mixing together of all the diverse identities into these beautiful presentations of what we can't be separate? Wow. You know, I, I want to think about tonight, not just mission, I, I, I like this name, Mission Connection, because there's mission, but what's an unconnected mission look like? A mission that's not really connected to anything. It, it can really only look like one of two things, and I, let me give you an example of each one. So if I'm going to go on a mission, and I'm not really connected to what's true and real, then one way I could go is like with this belief that it's this fanciful, I'm going to go out there, and this is exactly what I thought, by the way, that I'm going to go out there and the people can't wait for me to get there so I can tell them how they're wrong. And then once I tell them how wrong they are, I can tell them how I've been right the whole time. <laughs> and then after I've done that, I can invite them over to my house and continue to insult them long term. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Don Quixote. Here's, what, here's, here's how Don Quixote talks about the mission to his little squire, Sancho. This is what he says. Destiny guides our fortunes. You ever been to this kind of talk? <laughs> Destiny guides our fortunes more favorably than we could have expected. Look there, Sancho, my friend, and see those 30 or so wild giants out there with whom I intend to do battle and kill each and all of them. So with their stolen booty, we can enrich ourselves. This noble, righteous warfare, this is noble, righteous warfare, for it is wonderfully useful to God to have such an evil race wiped out 
from the face of the earth. Sancho says, what giants? The ones, the ones you can see over there, answered the master, with the huge arms, some of which are very nearly two leagues long, those giants. Sancho, now look, your grace, uh, what you see over there aren't giants, but they're windmills. And what seems to be arms are just their sails that go around when the wind blows and turns the mill, millstone. Obviously, replies Don Quixote, you don't know much about mission. <laughs> Wonderfully used by God to correct the world, to slay the evil race. That's Don Quixote, that's this, I'm chivalrous, I'm going out into the world on mission, and the only thing I'm connected to is my own mind. <laughs> that's one view, it's dream world, and when you get out there in that view, as Don Quixote realizes, he says, Don Quixote says, eventually I read, I spent so much time reading books on chivalry, my brain dried up. And I lost touch with reality. And you go out there and you think this way and it doesn't work. There's another way to go without connection. And that way is like we can't win. We're never going to win. Either we'll never lose or we'll never win. We'll never win. And so there's a great book written in 1962, one of my favorite books. It's called The Thin Red Line. It's also a movie. And it's this squad, it's this, these army soldiers that are sent into an island on Guadalcanal and they think it's clear, they think it's pretty safe. And they get there and they find out that the enemy is entrenched there and very strong. And they just kind of go up the beach and they just start getting massacred by the reality of what's there. And they're not windmills and it's not chivalrous and it's deadly and it's a real war and we are unprepared and we are gonna die here. And we are not gonna win. And so they're, they're down and they're stuck on the beach and they're kind of in the grass and, they, and the lieutenant's like, I gotta get my men out of this slaughter. But the, but the commanding officer's in the ships out in the sea like, you, we have to take this place. You have to drive your men into slaughter for the sake of the cause. And so it's these conversations between these different soldiers and this is what one of the privates says. This is his perception of mission with no connection. This great evil, where does it come from? How did it steal into the world? What seed, what root did it grow from? Who's doing this? Who's killing us and robbing us of life and light, mocking us with the sight of what we might have known? Does our ruin benefit the earth? Does it help the grass grow or the sun to shine? Is this darkness in you too? He's like looking at the Japanese. He's like, do you have the same darkness that we have? Have you also passed through this night? And then later on, one of the lieutenants says, in the days ahead, in the days ahead, some will earn medals and others will do anything they can dream up to e get evacuated from the land or end up in a muddy grave. But they will all discover the thin red line that divides the sane from the mad, the living from the dead. And in this unforgettable place, we will have the total experience of men at war. Which mission are we talking about? The, the dream world, like God sent us out to rid the world of evil people? Or this one where it's so bad and so dark, we're never gonna win? Both come from being on mission with no connection to anything. Tonight, I wanna talk about what it means to be mission connected. What is that? What is a mission that's connected to something? And what does it 
connected to. Dreams are just trying to win over the other person, beat the other team. So I, I've been thinking about this and this, I love this kind of idea of there's this thin red line. And on one side is like life and understanding and true. And on the other side is insanity and death and competition and team names. Like that, like we've all got to be apples in the end. We don't want any bananas in this. They can't come. Like that's why I love that Scott Erickson is the artist that did that. Amazing, amazing. We just told the story of the kingdom circles to him and that's what he came up with. Like that's the picture. What are we trying to accomplish on this mission? That one where you're cutting up one and taping over it and painting it to look like you ends in war. And it ends in people being sliced and cut. His joke, he told us, is on the blade of the knife. I said, it only produces war. And he put produce war. Like it's a war between the produce. <laughs> of which produce is the right way into the kingdom. Not, what, not Jesus. Which, what, what are we supposed to look like? So I, I, this idea of a thin red line, so I started thinking about this. I was like, what does that mean? What, 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 we, we've lived in all these places for, for years, in all these conflict zones. And, and what is it about? What is the mission? What's it connected to? And so I was reading in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua, chapter 2. So in Joshua chapter 2, you know this if you grew up anywhere near a flannel graph or something, that there's this story, you know, Israel, and they come, and, they're, and they've come out of the false identity of your slaves into the true identity of you are a chosen priesthood. That's quite a dramatic identity change. Oh, we thought we were just slaves. No, you're a royal priesthood. The problem, the question is, why is a royal priesthood living like slaves? That's a question tonight to you. Why is a royal priest living like a slave? Why are you living in bondage when you are free? What are you connected to? Like, how are you fighting the war of the false belief in you connected to nothing but yourself? Like, I, by the time we're done this, I want to figure out how to be connected the right way to the right person. So, I, so think with me too. So, the, so, these, so they go to the land, you know, and you, you know the story, and they send in these two spies. Like, go in and check out the land. Remember, these are actual real people. Don't like, I mean, it's, I love Jim Caviezel, and, but I wish I could talk like that other guy. You know, like, I just, I liked him just because of how he talked. But like, they probably weren't quite that eloquent. Maybe Paul was, I don't know. But not a lot of people liked Paul. But, um, but so, I, but these are real people. These are real people trying to figure out like what's going on in their world. Don't glamorize. This isn't Don Quixote. This isn't a magic book. This is a story of real people struggling through a world they don't get. We, we treat them like, oh, they get it all. They understand it all. They don't. And so Joshua is like, he sends these two guys out. And he's like, go out, scope out the land, come back, kind of do, do reconnaissance, come back and tell us what's going on. So they go and they get, you know, they get discovered. And they're in trouble. It's like this, like, run. It's like God is with us. Like we got caught, run. And they run and they end up with this in the apartment of a prostitute, which if I was their commanding officer, I would like, how did you end up there? <laughs> like, wait a second. What are you doing there? Like, that's not in the story. Like, what, what do you mean you're in the apartment of a prostitute? What, how did that come about? I was like, that's not important in the big narrative. <laughs> well, I don't know. My mom would think it was important if I said that to her. Wait, wait, wait a minute, what did mama tell the story of the Old Testament? I don't care. I want to know why you're in that apartment. <laughs> like, so they're there. I don't know why. You can meditate on that later. But, um, and so, so they're in this place. And here is, so, Matt, so there, there's two guys in there. And there's this prostitute, Rahab. And somehow they meet, uh, and they're together. And what's fascinating is, 
the, here's these three people, it's her family maybe, it's bigger, and they're in this <clears throat> little apartment on the top of the wall, and it's like, I don't know, Wednesday night. And she's like doing her thing, and here's these guys, and who are you? Are you, are you Israelites? Yeah. Are you the guys killing everybody coming in our direction? Like, is that you? Yeah, yeah that's us. <laughs> and she's like, we've heard about you. And it's not like, you're bringing the good news. That's not what she heard. It's like, you guys are pretty much wiping out everyone on the way, right? Yeah. Um, and she's like, yeah, we've heard about you and we're afraid of you. We're afraid of you. That you're gonna, that you're gonna come and kill us. Because we've heard these stories and we've heard rumors about you. But, but here's the amazing thing about this story. <clears throat> What's gonna defuse this big, oh my God, gosh, it's like there's a war and there's this bad group here and they're taking over and they're going to come in through the porous borders, you know, this big, ah. but then there's, but then here's the reality. It's a Tuesday night and she's looking right into the eyes of them, the them, you know, the them we're all afraid of that we've never met, the them. And she's looking right in their eyes like, are you, are you them? And, and they're like, are you the one that we're coming to destroy you? And, and they meet, they meet. Martin Buber says, all living is in meeting. Connecting, they connect. Even in this conflict that's raging and all this stuff that's happening, and, but they meet in just, it's, it's like a Saturday night and you're in like Oregon. And all of this is raging around you. And you're not sure, like, are you the enemy? Well, <clears throat> kind of, but are you the victim of what we're, yeah, well, and we're meeting for the first time. And like this suddenly doesn't matter so much because to be alive is to meet. To be dead is to separate. This is called sin, isolation, separation. This is called life, meet relationship like this and they're meeting and they're having this discussion and the spies are like we're in trouble isn't this funny we were coming to kill your city except now we're in trouble and we need your help wow what a, that's interesting like in our culture we kill prostitutes by the way when we get here we're going to institute a law we're going to hang you or stone you or whatever but tonight we're not doing that Tonight, we don't want you to be our enemy. We need you to be our friend. And we need you to serve us. And so these conquering spies are now humbling themselves in front of an identity that's the lowest one of their culture. It's like, are you going to sit down with prostitutes and try and get them to help? Like, what kind of a God would leave that sort of thing going? And so, they, and, and so they ask her and she's like, hide here. And she diverts the, tr you know, the soldiers and she saves their lives. The enemy saves their lives and they're her enemy. And they're like, thank you. The two enemies are helping each other. And they like, like each other, it seems like. And so like, there's some kind of mission happening here. Like who's winning who? Yes. Like who's being transformed by who? Both. What's happening? I don't know. Are they demonstrating love to one another or something? And if they are, if they're loving one another, then like whose love are they inside of? God. Is this a mission trip? <laughs> we thought it was a war. We thought it, you're a prostitute. We're the good guys. We're the Israelites. We're the good guys. You're a prostitute. You're not an Israelite. You're a bad and we're coming to fix that. And, but it, now it's all messed up because we met. <laughs> and we were actually having a conversation together. And it's like, is our God a God of meeting? That's exactly what he is. He's a God of connection and meeting. Not a God of like, you better switch and be like me, like right now. And so they're having this interchange. And they're like, we're so thankful that we met you, Pro prostitute Gentile lady. 
We're so, and she's like, I, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad I met you. Like, what are you going to do now when you come into this city to kill us all? What are you going to do now? And they're like, well, you kind of messed it up. <laughs> so because now we like you and like loving our enemies isn't our strong point. And so we love military power, loving your enemy. Mm. But now like we know you, you're not an enemy. You're a identity and a person. We don't like your profession, but you know, you helped us. And, and so you, like, we want you to be saved. We don't want you to die. And she's like, well, what can I do? I mean, like, you guys are going to call me? She says, there said, okay. She said, give me some kind of hope that, like, when you come, like, you're going to remember what happened here. And they're like, and so they're Hebrew, and they're think, Hebrew thinkers can only think in concrete thoughts. It's like everything that in Hebrew has to be something you can touch, taste, see, or smell. They don't have the option that we do to talk about things in the abstract so we can talk all day long about them and never have to do them. We have the, we have the leisure of, of language like that. They don't have it. Like if you say it, you got to do it. Like if you say faith, it has to be a verb. When we say faith, it means nothing. Oh, you don't have faith. Good luck. That means nothing. What does that mean? Nothing. But they can't do that. So when they say something to her, she's like, I need hope. And she's saying it as an object. I need hope. What is it? And they're like, okay, hope. And then they do, this is what they do. They go like this. Okay, here's an idea. This thin red line. The, he, this, the, the Hebrew word for expectation is cord. And they say to her, Hang this expectation of rescue out your window when we come. And when you hang the expectation of rescue out the window, tikva is the word, when you hang tikva out the window, we will know that you are inviting our rescue. If we do not see your expectation, if we do not see your expectation, you will die here. But if we see your expectation, we will grab hold of your expectation and we will rescue you. Even though your whole world is going to collapse around you, you will be safe in the expectation of our rescue. And she does it. It's not like she's sitting there looking at a poster about hope. She's like, no, man, dude, like if I hold my expect, if I like take an action and hold my expectation and say, come get me, they'll come and they'll show up and they will rescue you from death. And what separates me from sanity and insanity and life and death? A thin red line. And they come and she, she's like, here I am. This isn't in my, I'm not, this is like real, come get me. And like, there she is. That's her, get her. And they save her, not just her, her entire generations are rescued that day from disaster. And when she's rescued, <laughs> Joshua comes in, Joshua chapter six, and she's rescued. And it says, and, he, and she said, it says she is with them to this day. And when she's rescued, she's not just rescued from Jericho collapsing, she's rescued from the false identity of prostitution too because she's transformed from being a prostitute into the line of the Messiah. That's a rescue. They rescued her identity. They rescued her future. They rescued everything about her. And this thin red line that they gave to her, the expectation they handed her, she holds out the window on behalf of her people, her family. And when they come and rescue her, this thin red line passes through her into the Messiah. And this hope that she hangs out, comes through her, and becomes the hope of the world because of Tuesday night meeting. 
There is no little night in the kingdom of God. There is no, it's only Thursday with God. Like he's like, it's Thursday. What are you holding out the window? Nothing. Well then, uh, good luck on Thursday. Like it's Thursday. I, I'm expecting something on Thursday. And guess what the Lord does? He comes. If you call out to me, surely I will hear you. Do you know why we don't do it? We don't expect anything. Not really. So what are we holding out to other people? What are we connected to that we can hand to other people on the mission? We see Rahab again in Matthew, a different person. And then there's Rahab in the line of the Messiah holding out the red cord of expectation to the world. Wow. I want that to happen to me now. I want to be connected like that right now. You can. Listen to this verse, reading it like a Hebrew would read it. This is Psalm 71. It says, for thou art my line of scarlet thread. O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. They're not like talking about some dream world of hope. They're talking about, no, I'm holding it. It's right here and it works. It's real. It's connected to the one who gave it to me. When Jesus goes to the cross, the first time they hit him, the first time they touch him, this thin red line comes out. And you know what he's trying to connect to with this thin red line? You. He's holding it out. Every time they beat me, the cord comes out more. And I'm holding this hope out to you. Grab it. He's saying, I will, I will bring the expectation from myself. I am your hope. Here it comes. Here it is. Take it. Take it. Grab it. And when you get it, hang it out your window every day. Expect the Lord every day. Because this cord was costly to me to give to you. Don't play games. It's not dream world and it's not hopeless. It's real and it's okay because you have the cord of rescue. And so when I am, take this from, if you haven't like grabbed this from Jesus, you need to do it. This is not a game. I want, I'm grabbing this cord. I grabbed it because some nurse explained this to me. I'm like, I want it. But here's the condition of taking it. You have to give it away. You have to give it away. What does that look like? What does that look like today in mission? What does that look like? That understanding, this cord. Jeremiah says it like this. For I know the thoughts I think towards you. This is God talking to you. I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil to give you an expected end, to give you a red cord of hope. I'm holding it out for you. Then shall you call upon me. Like I'm here it is. Call me for this. Ask me for this. In what part of your life? Every part of your life. Ask me for it. I'm holding out expectation and hope to you. Take it. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. When you grab that thin red cord with all of your heart and I will be found of you, says the Lord. Grab the cord. I'm giving it to you. And then as you're going into the world, give it away. Give it away. What does that look like? So we, we work, we worked all over the world, but in the Middle East, love this testimony here. So we worked in the Middle East and I, I, this one time I was with this young Muslim guy, you know, he's 23 
and I'm with him. Someone introduces me to him, and he's a Palestinian born in Israel, so he has an Israeli um, birth certificate. He's an Israeli sort of second-class citizen, not a full citizen, but he's a Palestinian born in Israel, born in Jerusalem. Someone introduced me to him. We start talking together. And I'm, I'm asking him questions about like who he is and all this. And he, and he tells me that he, 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 that he has no future. Like I have no future because of who I am and my people and the, the conflict and all of these things. And I, there's not really, I can't go to an Israeli university because I'm a Palestinian, even though I was born in Israel. So I have to go to this university and this university is not accredited. And so that when I finish four years there, it's, it's, it's worthless. And it's like, he's like, I'm going to die here. I'm going to die in this conflict. This whole thing's collapsing around me and I'm going to die here. I don't know what to do. So like my thinking is, okay, I'm going to give this guy hope. So like what am I going to do? And I, 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 like, I don't even think of this. Like I've got this in my pocket. Like I live with it every day. Like thank God I have this. <laughs> this poor guy. <laughs> man. So... I'm sorry you were born here, man, you know? And, uh, and so I'm thinking, well, how can I help him? So I said, well, let's, like, I, I've been working with Muslims for years, and I, I, like, I know the Quran really well, and I know the Bible, so let's do a Bible study together, and I'll help you. He's like, will that help me? Yeah, yeah. So we start studying together, and we're, we're studying Abraham and all this, and I'm explaining to him the sacrifice of of Isaac and how the sacrifice is important and he's listening to me he's like I like I don't get I don't get it like you will if you stop talking and pay attention to my amazing bible study skills you'll get it like just shut up and let me <laughs> stop talking and then the lord's trying to talk and I'm like hey would everyone just stop talking <laughs> like wow <sighs> like no wonder this is not working here so <laughs> let me just talk let me just now, in the story of Abraham, like, like the, there's Isaac, and well, we don't think it's Isaac, we think it was Ishmael. Okay, all right. Okay, now, in this story like this, and this is what I'm doing, and he just has no idea what I'm doing. He's, he's par- there's nothing here, it's all abstract. <laughs> and, and like, and like you no, know, no, see, Abraham could trust God because God could work in a situation that Abraham didn't think, and then this guy says to me, can, can God get me a driver's license? I'm like, what? Can, can God give me a driver's license? I'm like, I don't, he, he doesn't drive, really. You know, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> like, he doesn't ever talk, I don't know. He doesn't talk about that. Be, well, I need a driver's license. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so the sacrifice, <laughs> like, you're going to get this. You're going to get this. And so then I'm explaining how Jesus, you know, and has come from that, and he, <laughs> And like, Jesus is the exact representation of the invisible God. And he goes, can Jesus get me a driver's license? (laughs) Like, so he was here, yeah. Can he get me a driver's license? Because really what I need in my life is a driver's license. (laughs) And I think, well, I guess. I've never asked him for a driver's license. So... Um, and he says, but he, so he, he tells me, like, here's my problem. I'm a Palestinian, and for a young Palestinian to get a driver's license from Israeli police is hard because for security and all this kind of thing, it's complicated. And he said, so to get a driver's license, I have to go down and stand in line at the Israeli police station and wait for them to call my name, which they might never do. I've gone down there and stayed the whole day, and they just never call me. And so I, I lose my job because I'm standing in line trying to get a license to get a better job, but I can't get a license because I lost my... And he goes, so what we do is pay a person to go stand in line for us. And then that person, if they get to the front of the line, they call us and say, get down here right now. And you get down there and you jump in line. You pay the guy for standing in line. And then the line never moves again. And then you're like, oh, shoot. And so you have to keep paying this person to go stand down there. And he goes, I've done it so many times and I just can't get it. I can't get a driver's license. Can Jesus help me with that? Because I don't have a future without a driver's license. And I like, you know, the story you're telling me, but like it doesn't really mean anything to me on Tuesday in Israel. And like, what can I do? And I said, well, I have an idea. Like, take this with you. Like, what's that? This is the expectation and hope that comes from Jesus about anything I think 
probably even at the DMV, I don't know, but I think. He goes, is this Jesus? Yeah, this is, Jesus is the one that gives us hope. Like, so, like, if you would be, if you would grab onto Jesus, well, I don't really get him. I don't, you don't have to, you have to really kind of just grab this first, and then things will happen, and then you'll go, boy, I'm glad I grabbed that. You're like, do we have to keep doing this thing with you? No. He's like, okay, I'll grab this thing. <laughs> like, good. And so, so, this is, so this is Jesus, and I like give him the thin scarlet hope and expectation of what? Of getting a driver's license. Does Jesus care about this? Yes, he does. And so I give it to him, and this hope, and he's like, I don't really, I'll, hold, I'll take it, I'll take Jesus, I'll think about this, but I don't, you know, there's, I have a lot of issues with Jesus, but hmm. And I said, I think if, if, you, if your friend calls you and says, get in the line and like you grab hold of Jesus and go, why would you not go? He goes, well, I'm afraid. Yeah, so when you're afraid, especially grab hold of the hope and the expectation and take it with you because it'll, it, Jesus will walk you through. And he's like, okay, well, yeah, okay, maybe. So the guy goes, I'm like, that's the worst Bible study I've ever done. Like, that doesn't make any sense, like what I just said. I know, I know it worked for in Joshua, but, but I don't know. It's like, this is a mission strategy? And so he goes back to work, and his phone rings, and it's a guy going, get down here. Get down here. There, it's, the line's moving. And he's like, he says to the guy on the phone, I don't want to go. I'm afraid. I, I, I don't want to go. I'm, I'm sick of wasting my time with this. I can't get a license. It's never going to change. I'm going to die here in this muddy place. And then he does, he does this interesting thing. He goes, but, and he, he goes, hey, Jesus, what, should I go? It's the first time he's ever prayed. <laughs> should I go? And he hears this voice that says, go. Don't be afraid. Go. He's like, okay. All right, I'm going. And he goes down there and he gets in line and he's standing in the line and it moves. And he gets to the front and they call his name. It's like I've never been this far before. <laughs> I've never been this far before. Like I don't even know how to drive. Do you know how to drive? <laughs> and, the, and the police officer calls him. He's like, oh my. Shh, stop talking out loud to Jesus. Oh my gosh, what is happening to me? And the police officer calls him and says, give me your, give me your ID. And he's terrified. He's like, oh my gosh, he's going to see my family name and he's going to know I'm a Palestinian Muslim. And he goes, wait a second. <laughs> okay. And the, and the Israeli guy goes, get in the car. Get behind the wheel. He's like, he gets in the car. And the, and the Israeli says, okay, go down here. He's driving through Jerusalem. Okay, go down here, turn over here. And he's like, the, you know, he's like, you know, <laughs> like he's driving through this place. And he's like, oh my gosh, I'm being rescued. I called out and he, he heard me. Like he's, like this is happening. Jesus, this is happening. And, the, and this, this policeman's kind of gruff with him and like, just drive, just drive. And he's driving down the road and it's like amazing. And then all of a sudden he hears this voice in his head. Do you see that cat over on the side of the road? He's like, no, okay. I'm not. Do you see that cat over on the side of the road? He's like, who's saying this? And it's, it, he knows it's like the Lord. Like you passed a cat that was hit by a car. Did you see that cat? Yes. And the police are like, who are you talking to? <laughs> like, I don't know. And, and, and the, he, knew, but he, he knows it's like, the voice says, I want you to pull over and pick up the cat. He has a big theological question. 
Does God care about cats? Does God care about animals? And like, are you saying like, hold this out to a cat? <laughs> like to the planet or something? Yes. And so he's like, oh boy, okay, well. He says to the police officer, hey, did you notice that cat we passed? And the guy's like, why don't you just drive? Okay, yes, sir. No, the Lord's like, I want the cat rescued. I don't just rescue people, I rescue everything. This whole thing is mine. I want the whole thing rescued. Don't think it's all about you. We're on mission and you're connected to me and I love cats, get it. So he's, he's like, like, I'm not gonna pass the driver's test if I don't help this cat. Like, it's, you can't love God if you don't love others. And so he says, please, sorry, hey, hey, uh, like, I, like, I love animals suddenly. And uh, I don't know where this is coming from, but like that cat was, it's not, it wasn't dead. It was like alive, but it was hurt. I, I really want to stop and help the cat. And, and he's like, what's wrong with you? And he goes, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I think we should help the cat. And the police officer goes, all right. Pull over. And they pull over and they're both sitting there in the car. And the police guy's like, what do you want to do? And, and, he, I, and he, he goes, the, the Palestinian guy goes, oh, I got something in my trunk. And he comes out and he's got a box in his trunk. He's like, I was wondering why I had this box in my trunk. I know, who'd have thought? But, and so he says, I have this box. I, we could scoop the cat in the box and, you know, maybe take it to a vet. And the policeman's like, all right. So the, they both get out. <laughs> so they're like, the Palestinian guy kneels down. And he's like, here, little, we're going to. You have a hope. I'm here to, we're here to help you. Who's here to help the cat? Me and my enemy. Me and my enemy. My lifelong generational enemy and I are joining forces to rescue you. <laughs> Grab hold. And so together, together they scoop the cat up. <laughs> you know, like, like that, okay. <laughs> and they put it in the back seat of the car and the Palestinian Muslim guy's like, I, like I don't, I've never really driven around Jerusalem. I don't know, I've never taken anything to a vet. I don't even know where one is. And the police are like, I know. I know where there's a vet it's over that way, but you better go fast because this is a bad shape. So you better like go fast. Just drive through the red lights. Just go fast. <laughs> Just go. And so the Palestinian guy's like, wait a second. <laughs> Are you telling me to break all the traffic laws? Are you giving me as a Palestinian <laughs> permission to break all the traffic laws in order to rescue a cat? And he's like, this is your driving test. Can you get to the vet before this cat dies? <laughs> Go. So, he, so the Palestinian guy's like, all right. And so it, like it strikes him like, look what's happening. I'm giving, being given complete freedom. <laughs> In the city where I was born, where I've never been free by the person that's my enemy here. Like, what is happening? And, and, the, and the, while he's driving, you know, and they're racing through the city, the police officer goes like, like, why did you want to stop and pick up this cat? And the police goes like, I'll tell you when we get to the, you know, like, let's get there. They get there. They're both like carrying the box in, you know, and they, and the police officer's like, treat you know, dude, fix this cat like fast. It's going to die. And the Israeli, you know, vet's like, okay, and this is a police issue and, you know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. It was a homicide. I don't know what this is. It's something. <laughs> and so, and then, and then the Palestinian guy and the Israeli are walking, doing this in the waiting. Like now they're invested. They're like, I don't know. 
I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. And the policeman's like, like, what? like why did you stop and pick up that cat? And the Palestinian's like, well, like, I think you can hear from God. And he hands the cord out to the Israeli. Like, I think you can hear from God. I think God can give us hope that we don't know about. Well, I'm an atheist. I know, but this is pretty weird what's happening, isn't it? Like, like this is a kind of hope that all, neither of us have ever, ever really had in our life. If God, like, will cause enemies to come get, together to rescue that, like, <laughs> what would he do with us if we would meet? Because he's the God of meeting of connection and like I don't know much about it but what I know I want to tell you about it and he offers the connection to his enemy <laughs> and yeah and the Israeli guy goes he goes this is, this is the weirdest experience I've ever had in my life <laughs> and the Palestinian guy's like me, me too <laughs> and they and they and so they, the doctor comes out, and it's like the cat lived, and they're like, yeah, and they're like slapping each other. It's like, yes, what an amazing day! Like, what an incredible day! And Sally's like, oh my, what a day! Oh my God, what a day! Oh, what a day! What a day! You know, it's like, <laughs> like I'm connected to everything. And, I, and I'm on mission. Is this what it's like? Is this what it's like to love God? And then love another? Is this what it's like? Is this the mission? Is it dream world? No. Is it pessimism? It is no. It's like fairly amazing. And then they, and the, and the, the cat's okay. And they leave the cat in the vet because we don't want them. You know, but... <laughs> We'll come back and visit, but, um, and so, so, and then they go back to the police station, and they walk in, and the Israeli has his hand, arm around the shoulder of the Palestinian. He's like, what a day, what a day. And they go in, he goes, give this guy a license. This guy is one of the best drivers, like, we rescued a cat. <laughs> and he was the driver. Give him a license. They're best friends. They're best friends. In one day, generations of I hate your guts and I'm gonna kill your people both ways. In one day, one cat, the whole thing changes <laughs> over one thin red line of connection like this and like this. Love the Lord your God with all of your call out for surely he will rescue you and then when he rescues you throw the cord out to the other and rescue them and and throw the cord out and keep throwing the cord out and not only does do are you no longer prostituting everything you know about yourself but you have actually now become the line of Christ yourself to your enemy when when he came to my house after all that the Palestinian guy, he's banging on the gate of our apartment building. He's banging, it's a tall gate. And I'm like, what is that? And I look out and all I can see is his hand, like up over the gate holding a driver's license. <laughs> this is what he's saying. Jesus is real. Jesus is real. Like not in my head, not in a Bible study. He's real real like out there on the street he's out there rescuing Israelis he's rescuing Palestinians he's rescuing stray animals he's impacting he's out there he's real this Palestinian guy was texting with him this morning he he he's the one that said I, I'll never go to a university I'll never get out of this place he's a junior he's a junior in nursing science in the United States <laughs> Guess who? <laughs> yeah. Guess who wrote one of his recommendations? An Israeli policeman. And he, his, he said to me his goal, 
He said, my goal is to, he, the reason he's studying nursing science is because he said, my city is bleeding to death. And someone's got to come back and hold out the hope of Jesus to this place. The Jesus that loves even strays. Even strays. One day, I was with him, this Palestinian guy in the U.S. We're walking across the campus where he, where he is. And he's walking along. And these, these Salafi students come up to him. And their Salafis are very hardcore, strict Muslims. And they come up to him because they know he's a Palestinian. And they assume he's a Muslim. And so they come up to him and they say, hey, do you pray five times a day? Because if you don't pray five times a day, we'll be right over here to make sure you pray five times a day. <laughs> He, he, get, he does this. He goes, hey. He goes, you see this? You see this? I pray. I don't pray five times a day. I pray all day. I pray all day because Jesus is with me all day long talking to me calling to me and I'm calling out to him. And this is how I know he's with me every day. So I pray all day long. So if you're only praying five times a day <laughs> and you want to pray all day long with a God who knows how to drive <laughs> and rescue cats and make you love your enemies, I'll be praying right over there. And that's how he outreaches to those people on his campus. My question to you is, are you that connected? Are you that connected to God? Where you call out to him on, I don't care what it is, and he hears you because you have thrown the red cord out and saying, I, I, I expect it. I expect it. We're going to pray in a second. We're going to ask the Lord a question. This is Psalm 27. Listen to Psalm 27. David says this. What would be, have become of me had I not believed that I would see, see, not think about, see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Now, now, not when I'm dead. Now. Now. What would I have become if I didn't know that I could see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living on Wednesday and Saturday night? Like I can see it. This is his challenge to us. Wait and hope for and grab the scarlet cord of the Lord. That's the word he's using. Wait and hope for and grab the scarlet cord of the Lord. Be brave. And of good courage and let your heart be stout and enduring. Yes, wait for and hope for and grab the scarlet cord of the Lord. That's what you can do tonight. I don't care where your world is falling apart. The walls are going to be falling down. I promise you in this world. Grab the scarlet cord that he's hanging out there for you. Grab it. And then when you grab it and you've got it and you're rescued, then become the line of the scarlet cord for your neighbor and for your enemy and hold it out for them. Here's the prayer we're going to pray as the band comes up here. This is the prayer we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Lord, where in my life am I afraid to grab the cord you're holding out to me? Where in my life am I afraid to grab the scarlet cord, that thin red line between life and death? Where am I afraid to grab it? And let him show you. And when he shows you, take it. Grab it. Because you are not going forward unless you do. And anything. And then, Lord, on mission, connected to you. Mission, connection, like this and like this. Lord, where, who do you want me to hold out the scarlet cord to, to in my life? Who? My, what neighbor, what country, what place do you want me to go on mission connected with you? Where? 
And when he tells you where, I just, this is all you have to say to him, okay. Like, okay. When you do that, I, I, and as these guys lead, I want you to do this. I want you, I want you to do what Rahab did. Prove it. Prove it. I, I want you, I'm serious. I want you just to, it doesn't matter about me. I want you to come down here and I want you to either grab that cord or I want you to come down here and say, I am going to hold this cord out to Yemen or wherever he's telling you to go or Starbucks or wherever it is. Take the cord, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then hold that cord out and love your neighbor because John says if you don't hold that cord out for others, you're a liar when you say you have it from God. Grab, hold out, and let them take it in the name of Jesus. Ready? Here we go. Father, Lord, I thank you for my Palestinian friend. I love that guy. I love what he said to me this morning. He always says, oh, and by the way, I'm driving a lot in the U.S. Lord, thank you for him and his life and what he wants to do and his family. And Lord, thank you for that officer, that Israeli officer. Thank you for that cat. Lord, thank you for how you care about all of it. But Lord, right now, we want to ask a question. We want you to search us and know us. We want you to reveal the truth of what's inside of us right now, Lord, because we want to be on a mission that's connected to you. Not a disconnected, self-serving mission, a mission connected to you that connects us to others. So, Lord, as we listen to you, would you just silence the enemy in my mind? The enemy that says, be afraid, you're not good enough, be ashamed. That enemy, would you silence the enemy in the name of Jesus? so sick of listening to that lie that thing that produces fear in me the lie the liar father you close them down in the name of jesus the lord rebuke you satan in the name of jesus the lord rebuke you in the name of jesus and father would you make this place holy unto you my soul holy unto you and lord would you open my mind to your voice just the voice of the true lord jesus the one who held out the cord for me when I didn't even like him, didn't even know him. With that Jesus, Jesus, would you speak to me right now in the spirit? And here's my question, Lord, is there any place in my life, any place in my life where I'm afraid to grab the cord that you're holding out to me? Any place where I'm afraid to be rescued by you? Would you say it to me? And Lord, and would you let me grab that cord, grab that cord? And then, Lord, is there any person in my life, any place in my life where you have called me to hold the red scarlet cord of expectation and hope out to them? Who is that, Lord? Who is that? Where is that? And, Lord, would you send me? Would you just give me freedom to go there? The people in the world, like my Palestinian friend, that long to know you. And we get the joy of being part of this. Lord, would you just show me who that is? And Lord, would you let me hand the cord to them? Guide us in this, we pray, Lord. And Lord, as as you move in us, I want you just to come forward right in the face of the enemy, right in the face of the liar, and grab the cord or hold the cord out to someone else. Just come forward any way you want to say that and do that. Because this is real. This is not in our heads. Lord, would you just move among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.